We have come a long way. I don't think anybody doubts that. The civil rights movement started as a movement of equality of people uh, of all races. As the 60s evolved, the drive for equality spread to other segments of the population, women, gays, Native Americans, Hispanics. We are going to address those groups uh, in this next panel and with us James Brown, as of CBS Sports, my man, the, floor, right? the host of the NFL Today, <laughs> Whoopi Goldberg, an actress and an activist, and listen to this. This woman has won mm -hmm. a Tony, a Grammy, an Emmy, and an Oscar. How about that? <laughs> I think, I think there needs to be some kind of a, a designation for somebody that's done that, and maybe we'll just call that a whoopee if you went off for <laughs> what, what an amazing thing. Also with us here, my friend Evan uh, Wolfson, one of America's most forceful leaders on the issue of same-sex marriage. So join me now as we welcome them to our group today. I just want to ask you all, uh, all three of you, after what you have heard tonight, what's on your mind, James? Hurt in terms of seeing what we've come through, inspired in terms of what one needs to do, um, and resolutely focused to make certain that excellence is, uh, is what we need to be about going forward. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What, what would you say? Well, just how much work we actually have to redo because it seems that you know we make these anniversaries but we're getting older and the people we should be educating about all of these issues seem to have other things on their minds and i don't think they realize the cost of our not their but all of our freedoms and that cost was deep people died and people were hosed with water and until we can re-educate the this new generation as to what that really meant I'm concerned about us going forward and how we're going to do things because unless we can get people to care it's it's just gonna be us yelling hey pay attention if we're not careful Evan what's your thought I, I really think actually everything everyone has said tonight is inspiring and real and true that freedom is not handed, you have to work for it, the country needs the work, but I, I really take great inspiration from what Congressman Lewis and, and Taylor Branch were just saying with you, which is that we have to tell people we can do this, not start by piling on the problems and making us feel bad. We can do this work. It's been done before. It has to be redone and it has to continue, but our job is to rise and to lift. What? What uh, are the challenges of today? What are the civil rights uh, challenges today, Evan? Well, I, I think the challenges are really two things. One is there are legal barriers, there are economic challenges, there are real obstacles in people's path, and we have to do the work of dismantling them and overcoming them. But in addition to changing the law and making sure the, the law is on the side and the government is on the side and the society is on the side of each one of us, we also have to make that experience real. It's not enough to only change the law. We look at what's happening with voting rights. Look at what's happening with reproductive freedom. Look at the work still at hand to end discrimination against lesbian, gay, bisexual, and transgender people. There's tremendous work of overcoming the barriers and bringing that to every person in this country so that we can all be part of the more perfect union that we're promised. As, as the country moved more toward uh, gay rights and focused on that, do you feel that the civil rights struggle, that it grew out of that? Oh, look, there's no question. The civil rights struggles, which of course built on centuries of struggle and the story of America is that struggle, uh, opened tremendous opportunity and galvanized 
an awareness of the need and the opportunity to get this country where it needs to be and was an enormous inspiration for the movements that accompanied it and have followed it and have built on it, even as that core struggle is not finished also. Uh, Congressman Lewis in his book wrote very powerfully about the, the way in which the civil rights struggle that he has led has in fact inspired and encouraged the rest of us to step up and bring our peace into this interconnected piece of work. James, let me ask you, let's talk about sports. You know, when I went to TCU, uh, no black athlete had ever played any sport in the Southwest Conference, which at that time was one of the most powerful conferences, especially in football uh, in America. Obviously, that's different than it used to be. <laughs> how, how, how are sports these days when we talk about civil rights and we talk about equality? I know I'm too dark to blush, but did I blush on that question yes, there? Did. I did blush, okay. I saw it. You saw me blushing, okay, good. <laughs> you know, Bob, um, it wasn't until 1966, from my perspective, that the college landscape changed. The big social game, as it was called, was when Texas Western played uh, the all-white Kentucky basketball team and uh, saw how dominating the Texas Western team was. And uh, to put it in the vernacular, every coach said, I need to go out and get me a black player, you know, to do the job. <laughs> and I recall being recruited by uh, the University of Texas and Darrell Royal came up to visit me as opposed to the basketball coach to indicate you would be the first black to play in the Southwestern Conference. So just be honest with me, would you want to come? And I told him, no, I didn't want to come. Uh, but the fact of the matter is, there is a more egalitarian stage right you, now. You wound up going to Harvard. Uh, yeah. Which is a backup school for TCU. <laughs> 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 Michelle, I should know not to spar with Bob Schieffer, right? So, you know what, but that's an interesting story as well, too, because as Whoopi and I were chatting, look, make no mistake about it, for my forefathers uh, and beyond that, uh, education was the foundation upon which we had to build. And I would hope that most athletes still see that while there's prodigious athletic talent, it is still the academic excellence that needs to be uh, pursued in order to enjoy success in the game of life. And that's what my folks drove home to me. So when I got an opportunity to go to an Ivy League school, I was gonna take it uh, hand in basket without a doubt. Um, I am glad to see what's taking place in the world of sports. Uh, we still have a ways to go in terms of blacks uh, being involved in ownership capacity and in the brain trust positions in front of office. I'm so excited about what Magic Johnson is doing. And when we look at what happened with the Donald Sterling situation, uh, let's not kid ourselves. That attitude is still pervasive amongst a number of owners, but Magic was sensational in the way he handled that. Uh, and his second act in life is far better than his first act. So I would uh, cheer that on. Oh, I'd like to, go ahead. I'd like to encourage all of you that are following, uh, whether you're watching on the Smithsonian Channel or on your iPad or your phone uh, or here in, in, in the studio, this is the one place where we encourage phones and we encourage you to keep voting. If you have any change in your uh, feelings about what you're hearing, uh, let us know. Whoopi, uh, how is it with you? I mean, you know, you're one of the most famous people in America. Uh, you're on television all the time. Uh, how are things for black folks these days, just, just in America? <laughs> you would not be typical, obviously, but... Well, no, actually, I would be, Bob. I would be, because I'm black no matter what I do. So I am typical of most black folks who are trying to, you know, do their jobs and not get fired and not get in trouble and not stir up too much stuff. But, you know, you see things, and I'm... I'm Sid, in a very bizarre sort of position for myself because I get to hear both sides of the stories and have to g give an opinion. And one of the things that scares me more than anything about where we are just as a nation is the idea of fact has seemed to disappear and people don't need facts. See, when I grew up, Reporters couldn't say anything unless they could back it up. And so, when you hear one idea only, and, and in a funny way, it's like music. When I grew up, you, I grew up here in New York, so we had WABC, WMCA, we had Cousin Brucey, we had, you know, WWRL, and so you heard all kinds of stuff 
on the channels you listen to. And you could make an opinion. You could say to yourself, this is the music I like. So I want to listen to this and this and this. And you weren't sort of segregated to one area. Now everything is like this. So we don't have to experience anything or make decisions about the things we like so that we hear something, we just accept it. A lot of folks forget you're supposed to say, well, wait a minute, how do you know this? You know, so I, you know, I like Obama. You know, I got to listen to a lot of people say a lot of crazy stuff about Obama. Because to me, I wouldn't want that job. You can't please anybody, but this guy can't please anybody, <laughs> you know? And it doesn't matter. I mean, a plane is shot down in another country. People are mad because he didn't leave where he was to go somewhere and say a plane was shot down and we're really unhappy about it. I don't get it. People are suing him. Congress people are suing him. Well, the truth is, we need to be suing Congress, because they really kind of... <laughs> so, Bob, that's how it goes with me. That's well, how it goes I, with me and most black people. I, 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 <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I certainly take your points. But, you know, Evan, uh, uh, Whoopi, Whoopi raises a very interesting point about, uh, you know, uh, these points of view. And, and it seems now we're bombarded with information. We probably have access to more information than any peoples on the, in the history of the world. I mean, there's so much out there that uh, sometimes I wonder if we, if we hear any of it. And I wonder, do you think that we're, there's a lot of talking, but are we listening to one another and are we hearing what's being said. Well, there's no question there's a flood of noise and a flood of information and Whoopi's absolutely right that, you know, information doesn't always mean facts. But but the but what really moves people is not just facts alone, it's truth. And there are ways of communicating truth that are not only about facts and data and information. It's the personal connection. It's authenticity. It's emotion. And part of the reason we've seen the progress we've seen not yet complete on gay people's place in America is because we have found a language in which to connect with non-gay people and help them understand better who gay people are, the shared common values of love and connection and family and desire to protect your loved ones and contribute to society. And some of that's told through facts and information and some of it's told through stories and through people and people coming out and talking to their relatives. And I think the power of what has happened with regard to gay people as we keep doing the work, is that we were able to break through the noise, we were able to break through the silence, the forced silence, and make a connection. And our challenge, I think those of us who really understand that on so many fronts America is not where it needs to be, is to break through the clutter and the noise and get back to that human connection and those stories that will help people connect with their deeper truths and the shared values that bind us as people and as Americans. I I want to ask you this. I want to ask you the same question I asked Whoopi. How are things for gay folks? For, for these black days? people. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> for gay black people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, gay gay black people certainly <laughs> certainly need more, more visibility and more recognition and more opportunity to tell and share their stories because their stories are very important. For example, where most of the discrimination in the freedom to marry remains, which is heavily in the South and parts of the country. For example, black gay people are disproportionately living and disproportionately representing and disproportionately raising families and disproportionately discriminated against and hurt by the denial of the freedom to marry. So in general, for gay people, I think we see tremendous progress and tremendous momentum right now, but we are far from finished. The work is far from done. We still have discrimination. We've won the freedom to marry for 44% of Americans, up from zero a decade ago. But that means a majority of Americans are still denied the freedom to marry. And of course, it's not only about marriage. And it's not only, as I said earlier, about changing the law. So the place of gay people is hopeful. We see progress. We see change. As Congressman Lewis said, it is a different America now. But it's not the America that we all deserve. And that's the work at hand. JB, 
Uh, talk to me a little bit about, uh, uh, we know there are a lot of uh, uh, black athletes now, and uh, we know that's different than it used to be. Well, what's, what's the situation in the front office in pro sports these days? You talked a little bit about uh, Sterling. I think there's still a significant amount of progress to be made. Um, you know, there was a recent study that showed, um, I think with respect to corporate America, that when women are in positions of influence and hire other women, um, that they're deemed to be maybe a, a women's group that's uh, looking out for them. Um, when blacks are in positions of power and hire other blacks, uh, they think it's an old boy network and that they're looked upon in an inferior fashion. I don't think it's any different in the world of sports. But we've got some black executives who are doing a, an, an excellent job. We need more of them. But when you've got the likes of a Donald Sterling who has been in place for a long time and there are other owners who harbor the same attitude as Donald Sterling, it makes it pretty difficult to get up. Look, I personally think that the prescription for success in terms of moving the issue of civil rights along is the same prescription that has worked. It was to me, from my perspective, a distinctly Christian movement, Judeo-Christian movement, Martin Luther King, the icon or the face of the civil rights movement, um, hinged upon the pinnacle of love and justice. And, and while the white kids who were killed in Philadelphia certainly shook America and brought the attention, and I'm deviating just for a bit to make a point, uh, shifted the attention to what was taking place in the civil rights movement. To me, it wasn't until we saw women and children, innocent women and children, and men who just wanted jobs to take care of their families were being beaten with billy clubs, hosed down, shot by the cops, when America had the mirror shown on itself man's inhumanity to man, I think that's when things change. We can't legislate morality. It won't happen until there is a heart change. So if we do things for the right reason, then we'll see the progress in all the other silos where there may be institutional racism or kids still being taught racist attitude. You talked about how you hadn't shooken, shaken the hand of a black man until you were a second lieutenant uh, in the military because that's the way it was. But when the mirror is played back on us to reflect what we really are, a lot of times it looks pretty ugly. And I think it's still a moral issue. I, I, one of the often quoted expressions is that of uh, Theodore Roosevelt who said that uh, to educate in mind and not in morals is to create a menace to society. And we've got a number of menaces out there because we're lacking a lot of moral character and fiber. What do you I'm still uh, What do you think is going to happen on this uh, controversy over the Redskins and whether that's a proper name for? Ooh, a put me team. on the spot here. Where's Alvin Patrick on this one? <laughs> uh, my producer with CBS News. Um, hey, <laughs> hey, Bob, I firmly believe that this is a a, a people issue. If, in fact, to me, this is my opinion only, not representing CBS Sports or News, <laughs> if the name is offensive to a group of people, then do the right thing and change the name. It's as simple as that. I know people will engage in an argument and say, well, it hasn't been an issue all this time. Yeah, yeah. well, the civil rights issue was one where that's just the way it was for a long period of time, right? So that holds no basis uh, in, in substance to me. Do the right thing. You know, uh, a number of years ago when I was a kid, um, there was a, a restaurant chain called Sambo's, which, <laughs> yeah. as I understand, was actually the last name of two guys who owned the restaurant chain. Yeah. But it was offensive to black people. So they changed the name, except for the one franchise in California, I believe it was. Of course. Well, so if, in fact, it's offensive to Native Americans, and it doesn't have to be unanimity on this, and don't just have a intractable attitude saying, I'm not going to change. That's wrong as far as I'm concerned. I'll get in trouble with that, but I stand on principle, so. You know, listen, there's a lot of stuff that's really bad. And when you, when you say, well, it, no one's saying anything. Yes, they have been saying something for a very long time. But now, because there's economics involved, People are starting to listen. You know, the Native Americans took dookie land that we said, this is what you get. They turned it into a, a money-making phenomena. And now people are starting to say, well, we, we do have to listen because maybe they won't support us or maybe they won't, you know, give us our due. So, yeah, change the name. 
You know, I, I just, I can't even say what just went through my head, but. <laughs> the thought cloud was there, though. The thought cloud was like, whoop. <laughs> All right. This has been a, a great discussion.